Hey, Fed Heads, welcome to another episode of Sharing Our Pairings, episode 28, Dram Cigar, cask number two. I'm your host, Cigar Surgeon, here on a wonderful sunny day. I know you guys have seen me out on some uh, snowy days. This is not going to be one of those. I'm here, as always, with my co-host, Robbie Rass. Rob, what's going on, brother? Just, uh, you know, living the dream over here, and uh, I've got one of these little cheapo lighters that, uh, you know, you get like, they're, they're like five of them for 15 bucks, and you can refill them, and they're fine. But I just found out that this one has this little switch on the back that no matter what you do, gas will keep coming out. <laughs> no matter what, until you turn the little switch off. Is that a feature? Is that something you want? Well, it's kind of like if you have the switch to the right, like it stays lit, I think. Yeah, like that. Like, see? It's just going. Wow. Which I guess is cool if you're, you know, you want to light like 75 cigars at once. But... The only way to do it is to flip the little switch on the back. So I was trying to light this, and then I almost burned my face off. And um, But other than that, things are great, man. I'm excited. Uh, Dram 1 was fantastic. Yeah. If uh, I'm assuming if you guys are watching us now, you've, uh, you've watched that show. Um, if you haven't, go back and watch it because it's great. Um, so I'm really excited about Dram 2. Looking forward to Dram 3 and Dram 4. Um, but uh, I'm ready to get uh, – to get going, if you guys follow me on uh, Instagram or Facebook or anything, you know that I was out drinking some beers earlier today with uh, with our fellow mod Matt Ross. He's in uh, he's in my hood. He lives in Jersey, but he's in my hood, San Francisco, for a little while. So we went out and had a few uh, a few uh, soda pops and uh, tore up. No, we're good, man. It's uh, it's you know six thirty. I'm I'm feeling good. Nice. Well, <clears throat> of course, we're here with uh, Dram Cigar. Number two, sponsored by Dram Cigar, also sponsored by your local distillery, Cigar Surgeon, or or Bottle Depot, I guess, mm -hmm. distribution center. Um, Dram Cigar, <laughs> number one, if, you're, if you haven't uh, watched the show, please go watch it or listen to it on podcast. We've got it all over the place on iTunes and uh, Podbean and, of course, the Cigar Federation app, which I know you've downloaded. Um, so Dram Cigar, number two, is a bit of a departure from number one number one was kind of light creamy sweet number two is more woody spicy which is kind of my um kind of my wheelhouse like that's you know kind of like cigars i tend to i tend to like something a little bit more full-bodied so we're kind of moving into that area uh so this is described we don't have a lot of information on the on the blend uh, what we do know is it's medium strength it's got a corolla wrapper um so we're going to get a little bit of spice but we're also going to get a little bit of sweetness out of it with that corojo um i already lit up because, uh, you know, I like to get into it a little bit before the show. And uh, so far, so good. It's, I mean, my first impressions are uh, definitely uh, some woodiness, uh, but it's still sweet. So it's, I'm definitely feeling more of a character, more complexity to this cigar than number one. Um, but I, like, I, I can see the evolution. I can see where they're going. Like, they, you know, it's just, it, it's not a huge step, but you can definitely feel that step up from number one. You know, one thing, and let's, let's be honest, I'm, you guys just caught me catching my face on fire while I was lighting this one. I'm about an eighth of an inch in. Uh, and what can you tell about a cigar in an eighth of an inch? Not a whole lot. But um, one thing I think that I've noticed about uh, these offerings from Dram is that the cigars stand on their own. I mean, there's plenty of flavor in here. There's a uh, really nice balance of flavors. There's good construction. There's, I mean, they're using good quality tobaccos. It's not uh, a situation where you're getting something that's a little bit funky and they're just, well, let's just throw it out there and pawn it off that it can be paired with something like this. Not that I know that anybody does that. Uh, but uh, with I, I'm, we could do a direct comparison to the Smoky Monks. Well, the Smoky Monks are good cigars. They're good quality cigars. They, are, they really, really thrive when they're paired. Um, and, you know, a few of those actually really did well on their own. Uh, but these cigars, I mean, even if, even if you're not pairing them, they're pretty damn good. Absolutely. Yeah, I would say um, cast number two so far. I mean, I'm only, uh, what, I'm only an inch in. And uh, Retro Hale's got a little bit of, little bit of kick to it, a little bit of spice, but it's still got that creamy sweetness to it. Um, I would smoke, I would have smoked this this afternoon with, with some coffee. I was uh, doing a review instead. Um, but I mean, like you said, it, it does stand on its own. It'll be interesting to see if it pairs as well uh, with the whiskey as number one did, because I think number one, you know, certainly um, not that I had any expectations other than really enjoying whiskey because I love whiskey, but I would say that the first cask cigar really uh, knocked it out of the park for me. I was very surprised. Mm, absolutely. Um, those pairings were great. Cigar on, on its own was great. Um, 
just within the first you know quarter inch here. Uh, this has a lot more, like you are saying, has a lot more body to it. There's some definite spice on there. There's spice on the retro. There's some spice that's settling on the tongue. <clears throat> some leathery type flavors, some earthiness yeah, to I'm it. I'm starting to get a little leather myself, yep. Yeah, it's and it's uh, it's definitely something I would say calls it full, full flavored. Um, I mean, I, I can't really make a... Uh, I can't make a diagnosis on the strength yet. I mean, it feels like it's going to fall into that medium strength uh, level, but who knows? Who knows? Um, yeah, but I'm ready. Let's uh, let's start pairing this up, man. Yeah. So uh, first up, we've got the Balvini Doublewood, or as I wrote on your thing, the Alvini, or my terrible uh, terrible handwriting. I, maybe I should have been a doctor. I yeah, know. it's it looks like it says Aquilarni. There's there's definitely a Q in there, but there's no U after it. <laughs> So and I don't know how that works. I mean, I figured maybe that was a Canadian thing. I didn't know. No, it's uh, I can't write very well <laughs> at all. Thing, um, maybe too much whiskey. But when I was pouring those, but this is the uh, Balvini Doublewood, um, twelve year. Uh, you'll notice it says the Balvini. There's a reason for that. Um, there started to be sort of a thing in the whiskey industry where um, people were perhaps um, taking the name and adding it to their to their brand to add some. Um, Add some, uh, you know, some uh, seriousness to the to the brand. So they they call themselves the Balvini to make sure that everyone knows that the Balvini is in fact the distillery. It's a brand. Uh, I often call this the redhead of scotches. In fact, that is what I always call the double wood, the redhead of scotches. Everybody loves redheads. Everybody loves the double wood. The double wood. <laughs> I, I I cannot tell you how many bottles of double wood that I've been through in the last twelve months. Uh, like I've, I bet I've gone through three bottles of double wood because if I can't figure out what to take with me to a, um, to a herf, it's a double wood. Everyone, everyone at the herf, even if they're not scotch drinkers, they'll try the double wood. Generally they'll like the double wood. Uh, it's not crazy expensive. Like it's, it's actually, um, in Canada, it's usually around the 60 to $70 mark, which puts it super reasonable. Um, yeah. and you know, like a cigar, it's, it's a good medium bodied, whiskey it's got some sweetness so it doesn't blow people out there's no peat um you know it's got a sherry influence so it adds some sweetness to it uh what can i say man i should be a sponsor for or a spokesperson for balvini because i mean i love their whiskey and this is just the double wood they've got lots of other expressions but um you know the double wood is easy um i think it's funny that <clears throat> you you went you had a whole lot of uh double meaning stuff happening there with the redheads and everything. And, and, you know, I'm going to get a little personal here. We'll have a leather couch moment. Um, I feel like over the last few years, I've developed a little bit of a thing for redheads. And my wife is completely aware of this. My wife is not a redhead. She's blonde. And uh, my wife is beautiful, by the way. You, you wouldn't believe it to look at me, but she really is. Uh, Good game, son. And uh, something about redheads. Like, uh, I don't know what it is. There's, uh, what's... There's the one actress, and I've talked about her before, and now I can't think of her name. I just saw her. She was in um, Interstellar, which that movie made absolutely no sense to me. Um, and she was in uh, oh, yeah. Jessica Chastain. Jessica Chastain. Yeah. And wow. She, I mean, yeah, she's not tough to look at. And nope. in the uh, the new Jurassic Park, which I'm stupidly excited for, um, they they put the, the main chippy. She's not normally a redhead, but they gave her kind of like a red bob cut type thing. Scarlett Johansson with red hair. I mean, oh yeah, absolutely. It. That's that's forget a totally that's that's a separate topic. But yeah. Uh, so anyway, yeah. I've, uh, now that we've had our moment, I've got a little bit of a thing for redheads. Absolutely. Uh, and that's gonna be. Let's do a giveaway from here. If somebody can tell me what that girl's name is, it's in Jurassic Park, the new one. I, the only thing I remember her from was Lady in the Water, and that movie was horrible. That was a terrible movie. Um, and speaking of a terrible M Night Shyamalan movies, he's got another one coming out. With oh, like, I'll say it isn't so. No, with like crazy grandparents or something. Like it's really oh, weird. Man. It's it looks it's like kind of like a first person type scenario, but then uh, the grandparents go nuts, and like the the uh, the guys who did um, Paranormal Activity were involved in it. So it's kind of got that feel to it. But it's only rated PG thirteen, so it can't be that good. But I, uh, I know we're way off topic here, but yeah, you know me, I'm, I'm I'm a huge movie buff. I love mm -hmm. movies. Um, he's made some brilliant, brilliant movies, and perhaps one of the ones that is overlooked the most in my mind is Unbreakable, which I think was truly one of maybe the, the best origin superhero movies, spoiler alert, 
for, I would say that it's ever been put to film because it treats the source material in the actual real world. Um, you don't see it coming and it's not to make a twist. It's that's the story. Um, and it's, it's brilliant. It's, it's, um, undervalued in my opinion, but man, he has made just so many bad movies now. Uh, after, uh, I don't know. What was it? The, the village oh, was the sorry. last one. And that's, that was a good movie. The first time you saw it. And then once I, the spin happens, like, meh, whatever. I had that movie figured out seven minutes in, and I was like, please don't uh, be some stupid thing about how you're on, like, some nature preserve, and it's really, like, 1995. And sure enough, that's what it was. And I was like, man, come on. Um, it was the same girl was in that, too. She played the yeah. blind girl. Um, and I think she's a redhead in, in real life, but she looks, she looks pretty many. upcoming. The upcoming one. But no, if you want to sit through and really torture yourself through a bad movie, and since we're talking about M. Night Shyamalan, and if he happens to be watching the show, dude, I loved your movies. And I'll still watch every single one of them, even though you've really made some bad films. The The Happening mm. is, is such an ironic title, because if you watch the film, nothing actually happens. Nothing happens. Oh, this is horrible. I'm going like, to do my Mark Wahlberg impression. That's solid. That's, that's an Oscar that's performance. No, that was good. Anyway, Anyways, let's move on. Let's move on. So we're talking about Balvini Doublewood. Um, I'm going to nose this and try and talk at the same time. Uh, they're one of the uh, sort of um, characterized as a boom uh, distillery. So they started in the late 1800s, along, or, uh, 19, late 1800s 19th century, um, along with a ton of other distilleries. So they're founded in 1892. Um, they're located in Dufftown and Speyside, where... There's like, I think half the distilleries are in Speyside. Um, they use the Robbie Dew Springs as their water source, which is a very famous uh, water source that's protected now. Um, my my um, source that I could find said they have five wash and six spirit stills, although I think it's more than that now. Uh, they're owned by the uh, huge, huge company, William Grant & Sons, who also owns other companies we'll get into in a minute. Uh, they produce 5.6 million uh, liters of spirit per year, which is a lot. Uh, that is 1.47 million freedom gallons. So that's that's a lot of production. We talked a little bit about some of the other distilleries last week, and uh, some of the distilleries there maybe had uh, production in you know one and a half million, one million, somewhere even below one million. So this is a distillery that's producing five times as much spirit. Um, if you haven't checked out their website, it's actually kind of cool. Uh, the thebalvini.com. They've got some really interesting videos. They've like high high production quality. I've seen them at tastings. Uh, goes behind the the history behind. Does some interviews with some of the um, people working there. Uh, really interesting stuff. Uh, anyways, um, they have a, a thousand acre barley farm. Um, as far as I'm aware, they are the only distillery that both uh, grows their own barley. Uh, and they malt their own barley. Now, unfortunately, because um, malting process for 5 million liters would be impossible. Like you, you, There's no way you could supply, supply that kind of level of malt. Um, but they still do it. So they still got like, you know, they do it for s specific releases. And it's it's a big deal because it's, it's so much work and not a lot of companies do it. Um, the other interesting thing about the, ba the Bellini is that uh, they really don't have independent bottling. So if you went out to, to see a bottle done by uh, another company, so where they bought the cask and bottled themselves, you really wouldn't find that. Um, they really only bottle their own product. Um, yeah, so now that I've got that out of the way, I'm going to stick this whiskey in my nose and see what I can find out. I've cheated. I've already taken a sip. <clears throat> you can sniff away all you want, but I've already cheated. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I know this whiskey so well, but it, like, every time I know it, it's just got this wonderful honey, almost like a, um, like a clover, like a sweet chlorophyll clover honeydew kind of thing going on. One thing I will say about it is the, uh, <clears throat> the nose is very clean. Yeah. And I, I know I commented on that in the, when we did the Dram One show, there, a couple of the, the uh, scotches we were drinking or the, the whiskeys we were drinking, I should say, um, had very clean noses in the, in the sense that I've got smoke in the air. I'm, I'm smoking a cigar. There's a lot going on. But when I take a sniff of that, it clears everything else out. I mean, yeah. Everything else is pushed out of the way. So you, I call it clean. You could call it overpowering if you want. But it, it, you're right. It does have that honey in there. 
There's and, almost and some a, stone, some stone fruit, like a bright stone fruit, almost like a peach or an apricot in there a little bit. Yeah, it's, and it's interesting because um, some of that is from the bourbon character. Um, almost all whiskeys start their life in a in a uh, refill. So the bourbon cask is purchased from the states. They bring the bourbon cask over, American oak bourbon cask, put the whiskey in the bourbon cask, and then sometimes they finish it, sometimes they don't. Because we're on cask too. Um, we're going for something with some spice and some more wood character. So in this case, um, and what's kind of interesting is so they've taken uh, the bourbon oak whiskey cask and then they've put it into a sherry cask. But what's different about this is it's a first fill sherry cask. So what that means is that um, you're getting a lot of that sher sherry character in the whiskey. Now, we don't know how long it's spent in the sherry cask. It's a 12-year whiskey, but probably didn't spend too much time in the sherry cask because in a first fill, a lot of that sherry character is going to get imparted into the whiskey. Um, we can't necessarily tell a lot of that from the color because that can be manipulated. Um, but when I taste it, I'm not getting a really, really long burn. Um, as you see, it's a very clean whiskey, so it's a clean finish. So that tells me that it didn't spend a lot of time in sherry, just enough to give it sort of some nice balance. Um, so you're getting a bit of that sweetness and a little bit of the spices. Mm -hmm. Sorry, oh. we sipped at the same time, which doesn't so make good, uh, doesn't make good radio. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I I will echo what you said that it's it doesn't you don't get that burn, um, and we're drinking these straight, no water, no ice, um, and it's not that we're just raging alcoholics that we're not getting the burn. Like it's actually really really smooth. I mean, you're getting you're getting a fair amount of uh, of flavor in the tongue. And a little bit, a little bit of burn through the throat, which you're going to get because ultimately you're drinking straight alcohol. But the um, it's it's really really smooth. Excuse me. Um, and I, I'm I don't know how well the pairing works though. Well, I'm a little further in than you are, and I think um, like I'm just getting I'm almost through the first third. Um, it's not a race, John. Yeah, the whiskey's a race. The cigar's <laughs> not a race. Um, <laughs> I would say that it is an uncomplicated pairing. That is, um, mm. this isn't going to break the bank in terms of flavor complexity for me, but um, it's enjoyable. That is, it's a no-brainer. I can sit down with this cigar, or sit down with this whiskey. It's good. It, like, it's just a good experience. It's not, uh, I don't have to put on my thinking cap. Um, I got a creamy whiskey with a little bit of spicy. Like, it's got some some baking spices, almost like a, a cinnamon quality to it, but not like very subtle. And the cigar is very creamy. So the leather on the cigar is balanced out by the sherry sort of sweet character of the, of the um, whiskey. But, it's, you know, I don't have to put on a thinking cap. It's, it's good. It's, it's enjoyable. I, I, the one thing, and this, this is, you know, we don't, we don't do a lot of this where we're drinking the same thing and we're smoking the same thing on the show. Um, just a few times we've done it, I think. Um, and, I don't know if we've really disagreed before, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer here a little bit because I feel like the cigar overpowers it a bit. Okay. The flavors of the cigar um, overpower the, uh, the Balvini a little bit to me. I feel like I would really, really enjoy the Balvini on its own or maybe paired with, with a cigar that's got a little bit less going on the cigar's got a fair amount of flavor going on and the spice for me is, is kind of picking up and the the spice of the cigar and the spice because this is a spicy scotch yep. and, and the spice are kind of uh, butting heads a little bit for me where it just becomes kind of i'm just blown out with spice and uh, but but this, i will i will preface this and if you guys follow my reviews at all i'm sensitive to spice so if there's a lot of spice in a cigar it's going to turn me off a little bit so i'm getting I mean, the sweetness is blown out. That leathery note that I was getting, that creamy leathery flavor that I liked is getting kind of blown out and I'm just getting spice, spice, spice. So that for me doesn't really work out all that well. If, if you're a spice fiend, which a lot of you guys are, um, then, then this is probably something that you would want to seek out. But for me, I'm just, I'm left with spice. Well, and I think if you're finding the spice <clears throat> to be a little bit too prominent, um, some other options from Balvini, which are easy, easy choices, although a little bit more pricey, mm. is the uh, Balvini 14 rum cask. If you can find it, I think it's been it's it's run through its um, its life cycle. So there's probably still some bottles on the shelf down in the states. Uh, that is just a fantastic bottle. Probably run you about ninety ninety five bucks. 
The other option is the uh, Balvini. I think it's the 14 port wood. So it's a port cask finish and uh, you're going to get a lot more richness to the, to the whiskey. Um, also a great choice. Also around the same price might actually be a little bit more in the U S might be 110, 115, but I think a great alternative if you, uh, if you do find the double wood a little too spicy. Um, no, I think it, it's, it's the combination of the two. I think I've got a, you were generous enough. I've got a little bit extra in here, uh, that I will try at a later time, just kind of on its own. Uh, one Balvini that I've got, um, in my, in my bar right now is the Caribbean cask. And I don't know if it's, it's if it's a 12 or That's a 14. 14. Yeah. Caribbean for the Caribbean rum cask. Yeah. That was a, that was a gift from my mother-in-law at Christmas, not last year, the year before. And uh, that's kind of like, for me, this kind of gives you an idea of where my, where my bar lies. That's kind of a special occasion um, uh, scotch for me. I really do enjoy that. And that was one of the first scotches, like the higher end scotches where I would go after it with just straight. Like I'm, you know, give me, you know, like a finger, two finger pour and that's it. I'm not putting any ice in it or anything because John told me not to put ice in it. He says, if I do put ice in it, I'm stupid. So I don't want to... <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be that guy. No, no, I'm Might just kidding. Paraphrasing but, uh, another. but no, that is, that's another, uh, a nice offering as well, but it's a spicy one too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like I said, that, that, that's the uh, rum one that I was talking about Caribbean rum oh. cask. Um, oh, okay. It's, it's fantastic. It is, it is a higher end scotch. I mean, I wouldn't expect the average person to go out and have a, a selection of whiskeys in the 120, $130 range. So uh, yeah, um, I would treat that as a special occasion whiskey because the other thing to keep in mind is that that's a um, uh, one-time limited production. So once they run through their, their production run, he can't get it anymore. And that, I mean, it's cool, but it's also frustrating, especially when you find something you really, really like. And then, you know, maybe a year down the road, cause you've taken that long or maybe even a year and a half to get through that run. Um, you can't find it on the shelves anymore. And you're like, Hey man, what, what the heck? And it's like, well, you know, try our new uh, Sherry finish. And you're like, Oh, but I, I really like that. Korean rum. Can I have it? No, no, I can't. No, no, you're screwed. Can I ask Get you up. a question? Because you seem to know this stuff. Now that uh, we talked about Glen Morangy last time, mm -hmm. the Glen Morangy La Santa, is that a limited or is that just kind of a all the time? I, I haven't heard that of being a limited. I'm pretty sure it's a regular production for them. Um, it's still on the shelves, still available, although um, I think that has become quite popular. So up here, uh, becoming much tougher to get might might not be so bad in the states, but up here definitely uh, challenging. That's good to know. I I have every intention, and I've had every intention of adding another bottle of that to my uh, to my bar um, soon, and I just haven't gotten around to doing it. So maybe that'll be the impetus to get me off my tuchus and go do it. Um, <clears throat> but no, that's that's good to know about that uh, the Balvenie, um, uh Caribbean rum. I didn't realize that that was no more. So. Um, well, I, th I think there's still bottles available. I just, I don't know. If, I don't know if it's end of life yet, but I know it will be. It's getting there. Early. Yeah, it's getting interesting. Get there. So I might have to seek out another bottle of that because that's a, that is really good. That's that's really good. I mean, there's there's some, and we're getting a little bit off topic because we should be talking more about the cigar and the pairings, and I'll stop. But uh, and again, I had some I had some beer and some man sodas earlier today, so I'm a little bit chatty. So feel free to cut me off whenever you want. We like to keep it loose here on sharing our pairings. You know, it's it's all good. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're gonna go on Wednesday. Screw it, let's go on Tuesday. Boom. You know, I mean, that's that's how we roll. We're just we're flexible, but not too flexible because I'm getting a little bit old. That's but, right. Uh, anyway, so I mean, for me, this first pairing, eh, it's all right. Um, I feel like it, it detracts from both. That's what I'm getting. All right, so we'll move on to uh, bottle number two now. There's kind of a funny story uh, behind bottle number two because. Um, as I'm prone to do, I take a bottle to a herf, I have some whiskey, go to another herf, have some whiskey. So uh, I realized after taking pictures for the uh, show that I had the Akintosh 12 featured. Now, the Akintosh 12, sadly, not the whiskey to be pairing with Drem cask number two. Um, that was really should have been for Drem cask number one. So you've got the Akintosh 3 wood, which yeah, baby. is exactly what they want. Um, I realized that instead of, instead of sort of punking out with the Akintosh 12, I've got enough whiskey to go with. I went with, and that's going to, we're going to get a little crazy. So surprise, we keep it loose. Oh. The Amrut. What's that? What the Amrut single malt whiskey, intermediate sherry. Never heard of it. That's right. Cause it is an Indian Scotch malt distillery. 
whiskey malt distillery, sorry. Like from India? It's from India. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that here. in a second. But I'll just kind of refresh. If if you haven't watched um, Sharing Our Pairings episode 27, Dram Cask number one, uh, go back because we did a big piece on Akintosh, and I'll just quickly summarize. They're a lowland distillery founded in 1825. Um, they have 1.65 million uh, liters of production, which is for only 435,000 gallons. So we're just talking about that. That's significantly smaller than uh, the Balvini. Um, they're... Uh, very few lowland distilleries left. It is a triple distillery, so they triple distill their, their spirit. Um, and uh, the three wood is kind of one of their prominent um, main sellers. And that's, I'm pretty sure that's what I sent you. In fact, I'm mm -hmm. that's yeah, that. the, the Akintosh and three wood. And we talked about this last time because one of the few clubs that I have in my bag is an older tailor made, um, super fast. I think it was the first super fast one or two. Uh, three wood and I could just crush that thing every time every freaking time I need to hit it and I just nail it So that was uh, I'm, I'm eager to try the three wood which I haven't tried yet So now uh, we didn't get the question on Q&A, which I was kind of hoping we'd get which is why is it a three wood? And I'm gonna answer that question even though no one's asked So it starts his life in an American bourbon cast. I was just talking about that almost all whiskey scotch whiskey starts in an American bourbon for the most part um, so they transfer it to a sherry cask, but in this case, it's a Spanish Oloroso sherry. Now, there's three different types of sherry. I only remember two off the top of my head. I have had a little bit of whiskey now. I'll have to try and think what the third one is, but it goes into Spanish Oloroso sherry, and then it goes into a Pedro Jimenez sherry, which is a different kind of sherry. Uh, typically more, if, I'm going to get this wrong. The Pedro Jimenez, I believe, is the peppery, spicy sherry. So it does two different kinds of, of sherry, and one kind of bourbon cast. So you're going to get a lot of um, bright fruit. You're going to get a lot of pepper. You're going to get a lot of spice. You're going to get like, that should have a significantly longer finish than the uh, double wood. Yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> it's interesting. And I, I, while you were, while you were talking about it, gave it a nose and it has a very, very sweet, very sweet nose, like a sugary sweet nose, like candy yeah. store sweet. When I smell this, I think of jawbreakers, you know, like the old school jawbreakers that are kind of white on the outside with little spots and, you know, they get prickly as you eat them and they kind of go away. You know what kind I'm talking about? Not, not like uh, gobstoppers, but like old school jawbreakers. Yeah. And that's what it's it smells that. like to me. It's just kind of like a sugary, sweet smell. There's, there's, some, there's some fruitiness to it. Not a lot. But just really, really sweet. Yeah, and it should have uh, like when you compare the sherry influence on the um, on the Akintosh and Three Wood with the Balvini, it's going to be significantly more. Especially, I mean, not only because I'm pretty confident they keep it in a um, in a sherry cask for longer, but two different kinds of sherry, so you can have more sherry influence on that than bourbon. So less vanilla and more of that um, fruity uh, and more of the sort of strawberry, raspberry, and then you know with a spicy finish. Yeah, it's and the spice on it. <clears throat> The spice on it is, I don't want to say less strong, but it, it's different than the spice I was getting on the double wood. This is really freaking smooth, man. Really, really smooth. I mean, you, you take a sip of it when you, you're not feeling any burn at all, or at least I'm not. And the pairing, this pairing for me goes much, much better. There's that sweetness. There's that kind of almost robust kind of strawberry cherry kind of note that you're getting from that, like a just more more berry style fruitness uh, that's coming from those casks, uh, the sherry casks, and you combine that with the woodiness, the creaminess of the cigar, and a little bit of spice on the end from both, really pairs nicely. It's much smoother. It's much more linear in the way that I've talked about that I like it. I want to take my puff of the cigar, my sip, the drink, or vice versa, however I want to do it. But I want it to kind of tell a story and end, and then start over again. And that's kind of how it's doing it for me. It's I, I get my puff of the cigar, I get that that creamy. Um, <clears throat> creamy, woody, cre creamy, creamy, woody notes, a little bit of leathery there, uh, with some spice on the finish. And then I, I go and I take a sip of the whiskey. I get that, uh, that bright sweetness, um, with a little bit of spice on the finish, just kind of cleans it up and then you start all over again. That's the way that I want it to pair. And it, I wasn't getting that out of the double wood, not to say that the double wood isn't good. It's, it's not what I mean. It's just with the pairing, this works so much better. They 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 don't fight each other. They're bringing different things to the table and making something that's 
equal parts that are good, making it into something that's great. I'm going to take this opportunity to answer uh, two back-to-back -back questions we've got. Uh, first from Harley Holmes. Harley, thanks for asking the question. Uh, Harley wants to know, are there any double or triple malt scotch whiskeys? Now, I'm going to paraphrase here and rephrase this question. I think what Harley's asking is double or triple distilled. Um, because the, the double or triple nature of a, of a whiskey is how many times it's been distilled. It's gone through um, a, a distillery, uh, the um, spirit still. Uh, all scotch whiskey is going to be at least double distilled um, by the very nature of, of uh, distillation has to. Maybe we'll talk a little bit more in detail about distillation in number three because there's a lot to it. Uh, but essentially the quality of distillation is uh, in order to get a proper balanced spirit, you have to distill it twice. Now, Akintoshin is the only company, the only distillery that does a triple distillation. Now, uh, why do they do that? Well, because they can, but um, that's sort of an Irish influence thing. We talked a bit about that last week or last show. Um, so triple distillation is going to give you uh, a lot more even bodied, uh, very smooth finished whiskey. So if you like your whiskey, um, to be a very smooth finish whiskey, Akinosh is going to be a great choice because uh, the very the very nature of a triple distillation means it's going to be very, very uh, um, smooth. Now, the only downside to triple distillation is by triple distilling the spirit, you are going to lose some of the character in it. It's their spirit. They can make it any way they want, um, but it is triple distilled. That's what I love about this show, man. <clears throat> You're so prepared. It's like you're like you're like Scotch professor. We should change your name from cigar surgeon to <laughs> Scotch professor. Scotch professor. Um, but at, I'm gonna I'm gonna just reiterate this Akintosh and Three Wood. I'm gonna go find a bottle of this. Hell yeah! I feel like it needs to be in my bar. And it's super reasonably priced. I know we don't like to harp on price too much, um, but it's a it's a twelve year whiskey. Um, it should be in the states around fifty to sixty bucks. So it's super reasonable. And honestly. Um, I've gone through probably as many bottles of the three wood as I have the double wood. Like those are my two sort of go-to whiskeys. Now, um, I do find the three wood is maybe a little bit from more advanced whiskey drinkers because, um, the flavor profile is a little bit more complex and that can be a little off putting to a new, new, uh, scotch drinker. I'll, uh, I just Googled, I cheated. Um, and Google. the, the Akintoshan three wood at BevMo, which is, just kind of my local deal. I mean, they're here, so I that's where I go. Uh, bottles, 77 bucks. Which that's it's expensive. gonna yeah, it's gonna be on the higher end of of where I wanna be. Um, but <clears throat> if I'm picking up a bottle, I think as long as I'm under a hundred, I'm usually pretty good and I can kind of I don't know, ease things up on the home front as to, well, I bought a hundred dollar bottle of bourbon, but or not bourbon, but whiskey. But you know, it's it's really good, and and you're really pretty, and so my wife will let it go. Nice. Um, but uh, yeah, this is something that uh, I, I might not run out and and pick it up from Bevmo at seventy seven bucks, but I'll keep an eye out for it. And when there is an opening in my lineup, it's it's definitely going to be uh, definitely going to be in there. Now I'm just going to quickly talk about the um, Amrit Intermediate Sherry that I've been enjoying, um, and then I'll go into the second question, then maybe talk about the distillery. So this is an Indian um, malted whiskey, uh, which is very unusual. Uh, India does not have malt whiskey distilleries, so that's kind of interesting. Um, good time for a hangout call. Thanks, guys. Um, <laughs> I'm busy right now. Um so the intermediate uh, sherry is uh, definitely the more advanced level of, of whiskey in terms of the sherry influence. Um, very spicy, very sherried. Um, the uh, the barley that comes in it, the barley that they use for mashing is actually an Indian barley. And I swear that there is like uh, an almost Indian spice quality to the whiskey. And it could just be my mind, um, but it is definitely a more... Uh, complex spice. So instead of like a typical baking spice, the cinnamon, um, there's more like a, a coriander and maybe some anise and other characters in there that um, that I'm picking up. Uh, it's 57, I think it's 57, 57.1%. So the uh, first whiskey we drank was a 40%. The second whiskey that you're enjoying right now is 43%. This is 57.1%. So it is cask strength. It is a heater. You can add water to it. I'm not going to because that's just how I roll tonight. Um, 
it is delicious. It is like a little spicy fruit bomb. Um, probably good at Christmas, actually. Yeah, the way you're describing it actually does sound like a, a nice fall, uh, a fall scotch that you can uh, almost like a mulling spice type situation in the background mm-hmm. there. Um, so I got a question, and I don't know if we've covered this or not, but you know, as soon as you said that, that was fifty three point one percent because you got to have that point one. Uh, whenever, what what is the threshold, or is there a threshold? for something that is cask strength? Um, That is a good question. There's not, as far as I'm aware, there's no lower level. Um, That said, I think typically a true cask strength whiskey starts at 46%. Um, You wouldn't, in in my knowledge, you would not find a whiskey poured out from a cask at lower than 46%. Now, someone's going to find a whiskey. In fact, if you can find a whiskey that is true cask strength below 46%, please email me, john at cigarfederation.com. But as far as I'm aware, there's not, there's not one. So, what a distillery does is they take their whiskey, they put it in a barrel. Uh, they might, you know, mix it with other barrels and then they bottle it. Uh, before bottling, they will many times water it down. Now, they don't water it down with tap water. They use the same water that goes into the, the spirit, but they're bringing it down from 53%, 56%, 65%, whatever that might be, bringing it down to 40, 43, even maybe 46 uh, and for the distillery, that means they get an extra 10 or 15% of spirit. So imagine, you know, if the, if the cask is, it's coming out of the cask at 61%, you're bottling at 40. Well, do the math. You, you are getting truly 20% more beverage, uh, out of that. So that it's a pure economics thing, especially if it's an older whiskey. Um, now I, I've kind of gone into a thing where I've been buying a lot of cask strength whiskey. And part of the reason is, uh, I've come to understand that there's more true character of the whiskey at cask strength and allowing me to control if I water it down or not. Um, but I've really sort of transitioned from a lot of, uh, quote unquote off the shelf whiskeys to stuff that might be special edition or limited edition cask strength bottling. Because that's basically just how you roll. That's just how I roll, but I think, I think you get more character. Like you get a lot more complexity out of the whiskey. It, it is sometimes tough to, like you wouldn't just sit down at a bar and pour a 63% whiskey and just start going to town. You got to ease into that. I mean, when you start getting into like, especially the 57%, it's, it's a heater. Um, that's a lot. Now I've had, I've had 63% whiskeys that drank like their 40%, which is dangerous, yeah. but I've had, <laughs> A fair amount of whiskeys that are, you know, 55% plus, and uh, they're they're powerful. You you're gonna sip it very slowly. You're gonna enjoy it, uh, you know, and you're just gonna you're gonna get more character of the whiskey out of it. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, <clears throat> when I go and I, I'm picking up a whiskey, or I, I tend to stick with <clears throat> labels that I know or brand names that I know or, or things that I've tried because a lot of those the spots around me they're they're not doing too many tastings. They're not. Uh, I don't really have access to, you know, the spirit that's inside the bottle unless I've tasted it somewhere else. Um, <clears throat> I do have some nice bars around here that I can go to and, 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 and do that and, and, you know, get an idea of what it is that I, I may be purchasing. But um, to make a blind, semi-blind purchase <clears throat> of, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 dollars, uh, it's tough to do um, <clears throat> for me. And I'm sure some people can just, you know, buy it. And if they like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't. Um, just for me, I have a hard time getting my head around that. So um, that's another thing that I love about these shows is because John sends me all these, all this whiskey that I get to try and decide. Oh, yeah. Although you are sending me stuff like the, the uh, Chichibu, uh, the Peated, which I can never, ever find again. So now I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm scouring the earth for this <laughs> bottle. And, you know, there's, there, nobody has it. Like there might be one guy just sitting somewhere in in a tower in on this high peak and he's looking down laughing at me because he has the, the th- last three bottles in the world um but that i mean that stuff was amazing but it's something like this this uh this akintosh and three wood this is going to make it into my rotation and i keep going back to it i know that and that's not what we're talking about now we're going to move on but um that's really good man thank you for sharing this with me you're welcome. Now I'm just going to talk uh, about this Amrit distiller in India, and then we'll go on to the third question. And Anthony, Anthony Russo in our uh, chat room uh, brings up an interesting point. He talked about uh, how the um, alcohol content of a whiskey changes over time, uh, and it does sometimes go down. It also sometimes goes up. Um, because of the nature of, of uh, evaporation within a cask, um, 
typically you would expect a high ABV whiskey in a cask to go down in ABV the longer it spends spends in a cask, but that's not always the case. Um, I have quite a few whiskeys in my collection that are 20, 20 plus years, and they are 61%, 63%. I've even got a 65.2% that's 22 years old. So yeah, it's it's um, it can go either way. It really depends on the distillery, the location, how much evaporation to the angel share you've got. Um, but obviously, the the biggest factor is really whether they're they're taking that whiskey and, and watering it down. I shouldn't say watering it down, bringing it down to forty three percent or forty six percent or forty percent. A um, little bit about Amrit Distillery, only founded in nineteen forty eight. Uh, they are Indian, uh, founded by uh, Sri J N Radhashrinka. Uh, Wow, it's terrible. Radhash, um, I apologize. I'm terrible at pronouncing the name. Uh, but is now owned by his son, Sri Nalakanta. Um, so his son has taken over the distillery. Um, the majority of their sales don't come from whiskey. Whiskey is a very, very small part of their business. Uh, really, it's brandy, rum, vodka, gin, blended whiskey, which, you know, blended whiskey is the, is the world seller for whiskey, outsells single malt by a significant margin. Um, but they do use locally grown barley, which is cool. And I think imparts an, a unique character to it. Um, what's interesting about this and the reason it's called intermediate sherry is it goes from the bourbon cask, the, the American oak bourbon cask into a sherry cask and then back into a bourbon cask. Now, I have been through a fair amount of whiskey and I don't know of another whiskey on the market that does that. So that's, it's interesting. It's, it's unique. Um, it's, it's delicious. Um, I'm going to go on to uh, Bob Dog's question here before we move on. And, and I'm going to try and get some more sips of this whiskey because I'm really enjoying this pairing. Um, this is a spice bomb together and my tongue is just on fire right now, but Bob Dog has a really good question. I want to talk a little bit about it. Bob Dog wants to know uh, what it is about the Scottish Lowlands that seems so conducive to distilling malt whiskey. That's an interesting question for two reasons. One, the Lowlands actually has the least number of whiskey distilleries in Scotland, believe it or not. Uh, and I'm going to put, I'm going to throw Rob right out of the bus here. If you were to guess at a region, and we haven't really talked about the regions in depth, but if you were to guess at a region in Scotland, what would you say is the region that has the most distilleries? Speyside. You are correct. Boom. Throw now, me on the bus all you want, son. I know things. Now, the follow-up question is, do you know why? <laughs> Negative. <laughs> Absolutely not. It has something to do with the water. Well, that's actually – boom, you nailed it. Um, so they have uh, this really, really great water source, this spring mountain water, um, which is just, you know, if anyone's ever been up in the mountains, you know that you get this really, really great um, water that's filtered through rock and uh, the purest – best water comes through lots of rock comes out really crisp and clean so that's a big part of it the other part of course is that uh you look in the space side region these guys are all farmers that's like they were sheep farmers they were they were uh wheat farmers barley farmers that's all they did they farmed when you're a farmer you probably get bored you want to get drunk or drink responsibly you start a distillery and that's what they did so to Bob Bob Dog's question, Speyside area has more than 50% of all the distilleries in Scotland. Wow. And I think there's only four lowland distilleries left. There's, I believe there's as many Islay distilleries or more Islay distilleries than there are lowland distilleries. So the lowland distilleries are really falling away. Um, there's been a lot shuttered over the years. Akintosh is one of the big ones that are remaining, and it is an example of a lowland distillery. But uh, Speyside is really the king of, of the Scotch regions. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure how I knew that. We probably talked about this before. But as soon as you asked questions, I knew for absolute fact that that was the answer, but I didn't know why. Uh, although I guess I kind of did. Um, when, when you say the, the Islay, the Islay uh, whiskeys, those are the ones that are stronger. That's the peated stuff. That's like the, the Laphroaigs and things of that nature, yeah? Well, what's interesting about that is technically yes, but if you look at some of the other distillers that are in the region, um, and, and I guess technically not Islay, like Jura or uh, Buclati, um, being an Islay distiller doesn't necessarily mean peated. Um, and what we're finding um, what we're finding is if I'm part of the industry, what <laughs> you are, <laughs> I'm just a, I own two distilleries. Um, what's interesting is that the distinction of a region, which used to mean a, a big deal, doesn't really mean a big deal anymore. That is 
you can go into the Islay and you can find a whiskey that's not peated. You can find a whiskey that's sherry finished. You can find a very light and delicate whiskey. You can go into the space side region. McCollin now has some peated whiskey. Um, there's other, other space side cause there's so many distilleries in the space side that have peated, peated whiskeys. Um, so what, typically you would find in a, in a region as a standout isn't necessarily the case. So, you know, it's a good guideline, but it's not a hard and fast rule by any stretch. Each of the regions can produce a a unique product now, and it just kind of depends on what they're looking to do in the market. So I've cheated and I've moved ahead to this, uh, the Glen Fittich rich Oak. And I think we're both, uh, we're both sipping on that next. Um, Yeah. And I'm, I'm taking a little nose on that. And it has that, it has that clean smell to it, but it's nowhere near as sweet smelling as nope. the the three wood. Nowhere near. It almost has like a like an old fruit kind of smell to it. Not yeah, like, like um, not plums, rotted, dates, not, raisins. Yeah, not rotting, but like fruit that's that's been around for a little bit. Not off putting at all. But it's it's got more more depth, I guess. When I think of a fruit smell, I think of bright, you know, thin almost, uh, almost a thin smell. But yeah. this is it's it's thicker and it's deep. It's more jammy. So this is the uh, Glenfiddich Rich Oak. You can see it's in the uh, characteristic Glenfiddich uh, Triangle bottle, which they're very well known for. Uh, we're going back down to forty percent. This is a fourteen-year-old uh, whiskey. Um, it's a bit it's a bit interesting and. Um, this whiskey really stood out for me. I, I mean, I love Glenfiddich. I have a lot of the products. Um, they're one of the older distilleries founded in 1886. Uh, now, interestingly enough, they're owned by, um, uh, by Grant's, uh, uh, Grant and Sons. Um, so they own the Balvini. They're, they're actually very close to each other in uh, space. I think they're like across the road. Um, they produce a stunning... 10 million liters and might up might actually be up to 12 million liters of uh, spirit so 2.6 million freedom gallons a year that like it's stupendous we were just talking about you know a distillery that does 1.5 we're talking about another distillery that does five they do 10 like it's staggering it's a staggering amount of of uh, spirit yeah and uh i mean glenfiddich is everywhere they are it's everywhere i mean there's there's um it's almost like a rocky patel in a sense that, I mean, there's Rocky Patel this, there's Rocky Patel that. There's always something Rocky Patel everywhere. Glenfiddich is, is like, it's on par with that. Um, everything, and that was what I started with. The first, one of the first scotches I ever bought was a Glenfiddich 12. I mean, kind of a standard Glenfiddich and the, the Glenlivet 12 were the first two bottles uh, in my collection that I went through. And um, for single malt type situations, that's a really good starting point. Um, this... This is kind of off the charts for me right now. Yeah, it's, I mean, you know this. And it's like, I mean, first of all, uh, for me, the oak is, it's just like a power bomb of oak. You would talk about a woody pairing. This is a woody pairing. It is super oaky. Um, I mean, I get like, like a dried, a dark dried fruit, like raisins, plums, um, dates. Um, you know, it's not, it's not super sweet. Like if you go back to the Balvini and smell the Balvini, the Balvini has got this sweet vanilla quality to it. The uh, Glenfiddich rich oak, it's just, it's more complex. Like just nosing it, you can say like, this is a more complex whiskey. I'm doing that thing that you, uh, you always say, leave a little bit in your glass. So you can go back and, and nose it later. I did not leave any Akintosh in my glass. I, 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 <laughs> I, I kind of licked my finger and stuck it in there and kind of licked it off because it's, it's all gone. But nosing this Glenfiddich, and like I said, I mean, that, that oak is there. I'm not getting it as strongly as you are, but I think you have a, a, a much more trained <clears throat> uh, nose than I do. I'm, uh, there's a little bit of sweetness, and that jammy fruit is still there for me. But when I go back, and this is the Balvini, I mean, that vanilla sweetness, I couldn't pick that up earlier. I didn't, yeah, say, anything, I didn't say anything about vanilla ever at all. And now I, I, I can't smell anything but vanilla. Yeah, and that's the American bourbon oak. Um, bourbon bourbon definitely imparts this uh, huge vanilla quality to it. So you can tell it spent the majority, and that's what I was saying, where um, you can tell it didn't spend necessarily as much time as, uh, 
as uh, it did in the bourbon cask. Obviously, it spent most of its life in the bourbon cask and not a very long time in the sherry cask. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this this Glenfiddich smells great, and I, I've taken a few sips. I've cheated. I'm gonna let you talk first. Um, but the uh, the flavor profile is deep. And again, this is the first time I've tasted it. This is our third, our third scotch, and I'm halfway through my cigar now, which we haven't talked much about the cigar, and we will here in a minute. I get smashed on my keyboard. But the, the flavors in this are, are amazing, and I can't wait to taste this on a fresh palate. Yeah, the, um, the, the finish, and I think to your point, it's, it's got like a, like a jammy, like a really light, complex, jammy preservative taste to it. Like, um, like not a, like a, like a off the shelf jam, but like if you go to a farm and you get like a, like a marmalade preserve or, um, just a, like a homemade preserve that doesn't have a lot of sugar in it. It's got a really fruit influence. I would say that is, this is very similar to that just with the sugar dialed way, way back. So you're getting a lot more of the fruity quality, but um, like the complexity is through the charts, especially when you compare it to the Balvini. Um, the Glenfiddich is just like, you know, we talk about body in terms of flavor, flavor character. This would be a medium full, maybe even a full compared to the, the Balvini, which is a light medium, maybe approaching a medium to me. The interesting thing though is <clears throat> I'm smoking the cigar and I'm in the middle and the spice is really ramped up for me. Yeah. I mean, this has jumped into a – this. it's not a spice bomb by any means. It's not like a Punisher or a cigar like that. But it's got a lot of spice to it. <clears throat> There's still complexity there. Uh, still complexity of flavor there. There's still that creaminess to it. There's still that leathery note in there. Um, it's getting a little bit more earthy for me now, uh, a little bit thicker earthy notes, maybe a little bit more rich. Um, but when I, I – you know, I take a puff and then I take a sip of this Glenfiddich. Glenfiddich. I always say Glenfiddich. Glenfiddich, um, <clears throat> you were just talking about how full-bodied it is. And it, it, in comparison with the cigar, the cigar almost makes it taste light. Mm -hmm. So uh, in a way, that's kind of a testament to the, to the, the body of the cigar. I mean, this is a full-body cigar. Uh, they call it a me it's a medium strength. Profile is complex, but it's, it's a full-body. I mean, the strength isn't going to knock you on your, on your tuchus, but there's a lot of flavor complexity here. There's a lot of flavor in this cigar. So, and I think that's why it kind of ran over that Balvenie at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> but these last two pairings, the Akintosh and the, the, the Glenfiddich, I almost feel like the Glenfiddich might be a little bit too complex or I'm losing some of that because of the cigar. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's an interesting, it's, it's an interesting pairing. Yeah, I would say that the, um, the, I think it's it's interesting pairing in in the sense that uh, instead of a spice bomb, which I got with the uh, the Amaret Intermediate Sherry, uh, it's like you say, it's more complex. It's it's a different um, flavor mapping. As a result, I'm getting a lot more nuttiness out of the cigar than I wasn't getting previously. Um, the leather earthy component um, really balances out nicely with the uh, complex fruity character of the whiskey. So <clears throat> they pl they play off each other well. They're more contrasting than complementary in a way because the gumflitic is, is really playing to the weaknesses or the, the flavor mappings of the cigar versus the Amrit Intermediate Cherry, which was just a spice bomb, a pepper bomb, um, which is, you know, very similar to some of the peppery spiciness of the cigar. So uh, we've kind of gone from a, a light body, light medium body whiskey, which you know, was there, but didn't really do anything necessarily for the cigar to the Akintosh and Three Wood and the Amaret Intermediate Sherry, which um, was off the charts in terms of sherry and spice. And now we've gone in the other direction, which is instead of being spicy and powerful, it's just more complex. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, I, I would definitely agree with there's, there's complexity in there and I can tell, but I feel like I'm losing it. I feel like I'm repeating myself a little bit, but I feel like that the the cigar is overpowering some of that complexity. I think the, the pairing is nice and they go well together, but I think I would get more out of this scotch if I drank it on its own. Fair enough. Now what's, what makes this, um, this rich Oak, um, interesting or unique is that, uh, it is a virgin fill American Oak. Um, so it's not a refill. So you're getting a lot of that, uh, that bourbon, uh, quality, uh, 
very strongly the the oak and the vanilla the oak really stands out for me and then uh it also goes into an american oak cask or european oak cask um european oak cask can impart a lot of flavor uh wood is a little bit more dense um so there's there's a different wood character you're going to get and it's it's rare to see a first fill or virgin i should say uh, american oak and a virgin european oak cask used because um <clears throat> when you're when you're going for a cask when you're a distillery you're going to buy your cask off of a bourbon company because they're cheap you know you might pay 48 bucks or whatever for a for an entire cask the fact that these are both virgin casks mean that um you're imparting as much wood flavor and character to that whiskey as possible. Now it also probably means that they're paying a hell of a lot more for those casks uh, because they have to buy them and use them themselves. I'm sure they're reselling them to somebody else or maybe using them in some of their other um, whiskeys, but um, it makes it an interesting and, and different product. And I agree with you. I think um, it's almost a shame pairing this with the cigar because the cigar stands well on its own. I think this whiskey would stand really well on its own. This pairing is actually working for me. I, I, I think it's, um, it's very different than the first two pairings. It, it is. <clears throat> that I will definitely agree with. I'm, I'm looking up trying to find a, a, some pricing on this. And the only, thing I, the only place I can find it <clears throat> is uh, the whiskey exchange. And that is priced in pounds, not in uh, – is it pounds? Yeah, that's uh, sterling. And I don't know how to. Uh, well, it's 36, 36, 25 pounds. I don't know what that translates into American dollars. Probably like fifty five bucks. Somewhere. I want to say that this has got to be the mid high seventies or eighties, because uh, really? again, because it's a it's a virgin cask. Uh, I think that's where a lot of the cost, I mean, it is a 14 year instead of a 12 year. So that adds, cause it's two more years where they're not making any money off the spirit. But I think the cost of the cask is really what's going to drive up the uh, cost of the spirit. Yeah. I can't seem to find it um, <clears throat> anywhere that's in, Oh, there's, here's a price price history. Um, it looks like it was anywhere from it started at, like 41 to 78. That's a wide range, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, that can change so, over time. I mean, it, it's, as people um, start to discover whiskeys, like uh, we talked about Tomatin. Um, I can't remember if we talked about Tomatin in the last show or a previous show, but uh, Tomatin's a good example of a distillery that typically made whiskey for blends. Um, but as people are starting to discover their their uh, their own bottlings, uh, it's going to drive the price up. I mean, it's, it's just it's economics. As demand goes up, cost of the whiskey is going to go up too. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking here at uh, wineadvocate.com or whiskey, wine, whiskeyadvocate.com. Uh, it was originally priced around 50 bucks, but this was 10 years ago or 10 years ago. This was five years ago. Uh, so it's probably gone up since then. So you're probably looking, you know, that, like you said, in that 60 to $70 range. But it's good. I mean, if you want, um, if you want a complex whiskey, again, um, you know, it's 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 a full-bodied whiskey um, in terms of flavor, but it's not a full it's not a full-strength whiskey. That is not going to bowl you over. You're not going to be blown away by uh, alcohol content because it's only forty percent. You're not going to be blown away by spice. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's an interesting, different whiskey today. It's <clears throat> it's really nice, man. Like the the flavors on this that I'm getting from the whiskey, it's brighter than I anticipated. And again, that's probably got a lot to do with the cigar that we're smoking. Um, I think that the, the pairing, the, the idea of pairing this, this dram number two is a little bit more difficult. Um, I mean, just looking at some of the things here, um, I happen to have on their, um, on the dram little cheat sheet here. Um, they have the Balvenie 17, uh, and then they go into Wild Turkey and Angel's Envy. Um, and even bullet bourbon, if you want to be in kind of that woody, spicy range, um, <clears throat> I'd be curious to try it with some of those. Something that's that's I, you know, I've I've had burb, I've had uh, bullet several times. I, I'm I'm very familiar. You with love bullet. bullet. I do like bullet. That is our that's the the home uh, well bourbon, if you will. Um, we've got a big uh, decanter. It says whiskey on it, and it's usually full of of bullet. Um, I'd be curious to try that, and I, I, I wish I would have looked at this in advance and brought some out with me because I've got some in the house. Um, 
the com the flavor profile of bourbon is very or a, a bullet is very different yep. than than the stuff that we're uh, that we're tasting but that's on the spicy end very so spicy. yeah so i'm curious i'd be curious to see um how that would work out and maybe we'll use bullet in uh with the cask three because they they want us to focus on some spicy so maybe even though you didn't send me any of that maybe i'll uh i'll sneak some in on my own yeah, and that might be interesting. Maybe we'll kick it up to four, <clears throat> four drinks. You know, three whiskeys and a and a bourbon. Um, I think with cask number two, the only concern I'd see with going to a bourbon is because you mentioned that <clears throat> for you, the spice might almost overpower the cigar. Um, it doesn't necessarily complement because you're already dealing with a spicy cigar, so adding more spice to the mix maybe not the way to go. And I know that for me, uh, one of the characters of bourbon that I like bourbon is 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 it does have that peppery spice. Um, and certainly much more prominent than, uh, than whiskey. And I mean, we're talking about whiskeys that come from a bourbon. Re it's a bourbon refill. Essentially you're taking a it's one time bourbon use refilled with whiskey. So it's getting that bourbon quality. You take a, a straight bourbon, uh, and you're getting full bourbon quality. So you're going to get, uh, certainly some sweetness, but it's going to be a, it's going to be a spice bomb and that might not be the way to go. I mean, if you like spice, you're going to get it, but I don't know if that would work for me. Yeah, having you explain it that way, um, <clears throat> and looking at their uh, the way that they break this down, and they even say it on the band. And these bands are really cool. Yeah. Um, they, they want you to have a whiskey or a whiskey that is woody slash spicy. So I think if we went full bore on the spicy, we'd just blow it out. I'm um, just gonna hold that up for our, for our video audience. I don't know if that's gonna come through because it's it's so sunny and nice and bright here. It's probably not gonna come through, but. Um, yeah, you can see it on you can see it on the uh, sharing our pairing page. We got a really good shot of it. Um, they've got a nice little, nice little details on the on the cigar band. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. The way they kind of they, they break down, <clears throat> you know, and we talked about this a little bit. You know, the whiskey that you want to pair it with is woody and spicy. The profile of the cigar is complex. The strength is medium. The, the, it's definitely medium strength. It's double corojo. Um, it's really really creamy. Um, creamy. Which which. You wouldn't necessarily expect, I think, from from a cigar that's blended this way. Uh, it's a lot creamier than I anticipated, um, but I think that's what lends that great pairing with that Akintosh and Three Wood. It's it, that pairing was just so good, and the, the Balvenie was a little bit too much spice. The the rich oak, uh, it's a good pairing. It is a good pairing, but I almost feel like we're we're kind of we're blowing out that uh, that whiskey that. Is, is a bit more um, on the delicate side and it's got a bit more um, that, you know, complexity to it that we're going to lose. So, uh, you know, something that's in the vein of that uh, Akintosh and Three Wood, and I don't know, I don't know enough about different types of whiskeys to say, um, you know, this would be a good comparison to Akintosh and Three Wood. And I don't know, John, if you could have something off the top of your head that would give folks an idea of, of the difference, but, or something that's, you know, comparable to it. Um, you know, I can't because what, and I think what, what makes the reason I buy so much whiskey, obviously I'm a whiskey hoe, mm -hmm. but every whiskey has its own character and it's, um, maybe even more so than cigars because I can find, um, uh, you know, if I go to two or three different cigars in the same region in Nicaragua, I can find a lot of this, you know, base level flavor profile similar between different types of cigars. Certainly there's lots of differences based on blending and binders and whatever but with whiskey i can get two different whiskeys from the same distillery and have a completely different flavor profile i mean completely different flavor profile um i've gone to a distillery and you know try five whiskeys and four of them are like meh one of them is amazing and so i end up with this you know eclectic collection of like different weight like different whiskeys from like 80 different distilleries um but each of them has a unique character and unique flavor profile that i really enjoy um so truly the akintosh and three wood uh is unique um it offers a lot more wood spice and um, and the closest for me is the balvini double wood the double wood is just it's a milder sweeter version of the akintosh and three wood to me and that's why those two are sort of staple go-to's in my collection so it's interesting the way that you describe it, <clears throat> and maybe we'll wrap up after this, is that, that I've, I got so much more spice out of the, the Balvenie than I did the Akintosh. Well, have you gone back? Have you, have you tried another sip of the Balvenie? 
Uh, I can. I haven't, but I can. There's a little Go bit ahead. more in there. Maybe I'll do that just, <clears throat> just for science. Yeah, it's it's all about the science. It's not about the whiskey. We're just, you know, pairing for you guys. Um, but I always recommend leaving a little in the glass, especially if you're doing a, a tasting a range, because you're going to get a lot more character as your palate warms up. You need a lot more flavor out of that whiskey when you go back to it the second time. And uh, I, I would say that for me, the uh, the Amrit Intermediate is the hands down winner for, for what I like. Um, that is the perfect sort of combination of that woody, spicy quality that I'm looking for. It does overpower the cigar a bit. So if I'm looking to pair uh, and not overpower the cigar, for me, the Balvini is a no-brainer. It's, it's an easy pairing. It's not a complex pairing. It's an easy pairing. Um, if I was looking for something that wasn't as spicy, the Glymphitic 14 Rich Oak, no-brainer. Absolutely no-brainer for me. Yeah, I went back and uh, <clears throat> I tried the Balvini again. And it, it's not quite as spicy um, as it was to begin with, but it, it still doesn't – that Akintosh and Three Wood was just perfect. And that's another thing that I like about this show is that, you know, we've we've managed to – well, we'll find stuff that may not work, the trial and error aspect of it. Uh, you know, we get – of the three that we usually do, three or four, we vary on what we're doing here. Um there's usually one in there that pairs really, really well. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the hands down winner for me is that Akintosh and three, but it's, it is the, the pairing. It, it, it's simply perfect. It's, it's ev everything that I want that, you know, I've learned from this show what I want from a pairing. It gives me that with, uh, you know, and I, I've already talked about, it, I want to, you know, beat the dead horse, but the, the way that the flavors all work, that linear story where I can start, and finish and start over again that's kind of i want each sip and puff to kind of just kind of go and be a little bit like cyclical be a little bit you know just kind of rotate keep going and give me the same kind of feeling every time and maybe you know maybe things kick up a little bit because the you know you do get different uh flavors as you go through the cigar um and you know maybe now i'm getting a little bit different flavors from the cigar than i was you know when i was uh pairing with the octash and three with to begin with but Unless the changes are really drastic, which they haven't been, um, that pairing really, really works for me. Well, what's in, like I said, what, what is interesting is that we can have the same cigar, we can have at least two out of the three same whiskeys and get different um, different flavor profiles that we enjoy personally. So, um, you know, as we always say on the show, it, it, part of the fun for us is, is trying out new stuff, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't, seeing what we like personally. Um, you know, and I think the show really affords us the opportunity or affords you the opportunity, affords us the opportunity to, to try a bunch of stuff that we wouldn't otherwise try on our own, move out of our comfort zone, try different things. You found a new whiskey that, you know, is now on your radar um, that you probably otherwise wouldn't have uh, come across unless we were at the IPCPR and uh, draining the uh, draining the bar of wherever we were. <laughs> that, I'm looking forward to that, man. Like it's, it's, it's still a couple months away, but I, I it's, it's funny, man. I'm, I'm, I'm just as excited about, you know, finding different bars with you and finding different stuff to taste as I am about, you know, going and checking out all the different cigars. So um, that's, uh, I don't know what that says about me, but, you know, whatever. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Anyways, um, you know, we'll probably wrap it up here because uh, we're, we're going pretty good and um, I'm feeling pretty loose from the whiskey. I just want to send thanks out to all our podcast listeners. Uh, you guys are out there in droves and we really, really appreciate you listening to the show, whether it's on iTunes, Podbean, or through the Cigar Federation app. Uh, thanks to our live viewers. Uh, I know you guys tune in every week or every other week when we have our show. Appreciate you watching live. Or if you're watching it the next day, it is on YouTube. Make sure to subscribe to our channel. Um, the more subscribers we have, the more fancy things we can bring you guys. So appreciate that. And uh, thanks to uh, Bob Dog and um, and Harley for uh, asking questions. Uh, we we appreciate the questions. I mean, I like being put on the spot. I like uh, answering stuff that I'm not prepared for. It's fun. Um, so if you guys have a chance to go into our Q and A app on Google Plus and throw in some questions before the show, we appreciate it. Thanks very much. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so we've got a little bit of a lull between now and our next show, right? Because mm -hmm. you're going on vacation, and then oh, yeah. uh, I'm going to be in Nicaragua. Nicaragua. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to that trip too. That's going to be fun. Um, so uh, when is our next show? I'll, uh, let me see if I can pull it up while you're. Yeah, we're going to be, we're going to be doing like three weeks, I think. 
Um, it's going to be on a Monday. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about what we got coming up this week while we look that up. So uh, tomorrow, of course, we've got the Jose Blanco uh, blending seminar. For those of you who got in your kits, uh, you're going to have a friggin' blast. Uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to attend a Jose Blanco blending seminar, I have not, sadly. Um, for those of you in for that, you're going to have an absolute, just, it's going to rock your socks. Jose Blanco, amazing man. Uh, we'll t you will learn so much. Uh, if you didn't tune into What Embargo tonight, uh, catch it again on uh, podcast, catch it again on our YouTube channel. Uh, and then we're going to have a uh, cigar chat on uh, Thursday with uh, Cesar Espinel. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. We're from, uh, we met, uh, we met Cesar, uh, Cesar. We met Cesar, Cesar. at uh, IPCPR and he's had his uh, release, his released few cigars since then. And they've had very good reviews. I haven't smoked any of them yet. Um, we're looking forward to talking to him on Thursday. Uh, our next um, sharing our pairing show is going to be. You're right. It is on a Monday, <clears throat> and again, that that's that's my fault with uh, you know with baseball and everything. I have to be at the ballpark. Uh, Wednesdays get tough. Um, Wednesdays, if there's a home game, it's a night game on a Wednesday. Uh, there's not too many uh, Wednesday day games. I mean, and there can be, but even then, it's it's tough for me to get to to get back here and ready to go at a reasonable time. So we're going Monday, May 11th. And that's when we'll do uh, Dram uh, Cask uh, number three. So that'll be interesting. That'll be interesting to try that one out. Um, I'll have a review of the number two coming up here pretty soon, paired with something. I'm not really sure what, but we'll uh, we'll pair that up pretty soon. Have a review of that coming up. Um, and then after the the Drams, we're going to get into we're going to do another soda pop show. We've got coffee with Twin Engine. They're coming on. Uh, so this, uh, some of our, our pairing shows are going to get pretty interesting coming up. So that'll be uh, something to look forward to. And uh, sometime in July, maybe late July, um, maybe even early August, but I'm thinking late July, we're going to have Andrew Ferguson on again. Uh, if you guys tuned into our um, uh, to our highfalutin show, Andrew Ferguson came on. Andrew is a true Scotch expert. Uh, he had some uh, really cool stuff to talk about. Uh, he's going to be coming back on the show. We're also going to have uh, one of his friends who's uh, a Cuban cigar aficionado. So we might change things up. We haven't had any Cuban cigars on the show because, you know, Cuban cigars. Um, but we might switch things up, get a little interesting for a future show. Uh, that'll be a fun one to tune into. We're going to have some, uh, some cool stuff to pair, I'm sure. Yeah, now I can smoke them legally. Boom. Yeah. So that's good. And, uh, you know, a couple of the, a uh, couple of the things I know we are going to have, uh, Enrique from 1502 to come on. Um, cause he's got a coffee now. We'll probably talk about some Florida Kanye when we do that as well. Um, I haven't set a date for that yet, but I know it's definitely something that's going to be coming up in the future. So a lot of cool things coming up. So appreciate you guys tuning in as we always say, drink better and drink less. Thanks very much. <laughs>